Good evening, friends, and welcome again to Storytime for Adults. As I mentioned during our Storytime in December, Storytime for Adults is now a regular thing. Stories will post the fourth Monday of every month, and in certain months or seasons, we may see some extra stories produced as well. So, it is March, and among many other things, that means that St. Patrick's Day is this month, and that, of course, gives us a perfect excuse to read some stories by famous Irish authors. Okay, so the St. Patrick's Day connection may be a bit of a stretch, but bear with me. Now, I've read stories by an Irish author before in Storytime for Adults. Uh, last summer we read a couple of stories by Lord Dunsany, who was a massively popular Irish author, an actual literal lord. And of course the famous, and in his own life infamous, Oscar Wilde was also Irish. But today we'll be reading some stories by an author who started life a bit farther down the socioeconomic ladder from Lord Dunsany but whose name today has far vaster recognition, and frankly, rightly so. A poet, teacher, literary critic, writer, and major figure in the modernist avant-garde who gave us stream of consciousness writing, James Joyce was unarguably one of the single greatest and most influential writers of the 20th century in any language. His major opus, Ulysses, is actually responsible for laying the foundations of modern obscenity law in the United States. When the United States government decided to sue the book. So who was he? James Augustine Aloysius Joyce was born in Dublin, Ireland on February 2nd, 1882, into an Irish Catholic middle-class family. Joyce was the oldest of 12 children, 10 who would survive to adulthood. Though Joyce's family was solidly middle-class at his birth, as more and more of his siblings were born, the strains on the family's finances became greater and greater. And Joyce's father eventually began drinking more and more with predictable results for the family and all the instability and turmoil that that implies. From a very young age, Joyce stood out as particularly bright and was educated by Jesuit priests at Clongos Woods College, Belvedere College, and ultimately University College Dublin. He first began writing as a poet and attracted the attention of no less a poetic luminary than William Butler Yeats who encouraged Joyce to apply his prodigious talent to discovering new modes and methods of writing. Now we could fairly say, with the benefit of hindsight, that this may rank as one of the all-time great and underappreciated at the time pieces of advice. On June 16th, 1904, James Joyce would meet Nora Barnacle, his future wife, and within six months he'd convinced her to come with him into exile on the European continent. They eventually settled in Trieste, in modern-day northern Italy, when Nora gave birth to their two children, Giorgio and Lucia. During this time, Joyce scraped by as a language teacher at the Berlitz School, yes, that Berlitz, and literary critic, with occasional forays into journalism and translation. Uh, Joyce fluently spoke five languages and was literate in a further twelve, and was the first person to translate both Yeats and Oscar Wilde into Italian. During this time, Joyce completed his first work of fiction, the short story collection Dubliners that we will be reading from tonight. He struggled to get it published, however. The book was eventually published in 1915, a full nine years after he'd completed it, and after having been rejected some 22 times by 15 different publishers. During this time, Joyce had also begun to work on what would become his best known and most influential work, Ulysses. The American poet and author Ezra Pound was so impressed by Dubliners that he helped arrange to have Ulysses published serially, beginning in 1918, in the American journal The Little Review. In 1920, the edition of The Little Review containing the Nausicaa episode led to a prosecution for obscenity under the Comstock Act of 1873, which made it illegal to circulate materials deemed obscene in the U.S. mail. The trial of the literary magazine, which finished in 1921, declared the work obscene, effectively banning it in the United States. In 1919, the novel was also banned in the United Kingdom. Ulysses was first published in its entirety in Paris in 1922 on Joyce's 40th birthday. Throughout the 1920s, the United States Post Office regularly seized and burned copies of the book Ulysses. Finally, in 1933, Random House Publishers and the lawyer Morris Ernst decided to import French copies of the book and arranged to have them seized by U.S. Customs. Random House then contested the seizure, leading to the court case, the United States versus one book called Ulysses. In the trial decision, the judge in the case, John M. Woolsey, ruled that Ulysses was not pornographic and thus could not be obscene. 
The judicial opinion itself is even today considered a thorough and academically serious literary deconstruction of the work, in which the judge himself remarks on the startling success of Joyce's stream of consciousness style, as well as noting the overall context of the events and content of the book. After the decision was announced, Random House began typesetting and the first copies of Ulysses were published in the United States in 1934, 12 years after its original publication in Ireland. The initial ruling was appealed by the government, but ultimately upheld by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Together, the trial and appellate decisions established that a court applying obscenity standards should consider the work as a whole, not just selected excerpts, the effects on an average rather than overly sensitive person, and contemporary community standards. These principles filtered through a long line of later cases and ultimately influenced by the U.S. Supreme Court case or Supreme Court has influenced the United States case law on obscenity standards that hold through this day. Now, Ulysses itself is an amazingly complicated, if very difficult book. The novel follows the actions of Leopold Bloom, an average man in an average day in his life in Dublin. The book is written, however, so that its 18 chapters all parallel and mirror the equivalent chapters in Homer's epic poem, The Odyssey. Ulysses, the name, is the Latin translation of Odysseus and literally means to travel. The book is chock full of references to everything from classical mythology to medieval history, biblical narrative, Anglo-Saxon poetry, and Dante's Divine Comedy. Each chapter in the book is also written in a different and distinct historical literary style, culminating in the final chapter being written stream of consciousness from the perspective of Leopold's wife, Molly Bloom. The book is also set on a very particular day, June 16th, 1904, the same day that Joyce met his wife, Nora. Joyce eventually went on to write a denser and even more difficult book, Finnegan's Wake, with a young Samuel Beckett working as his scribe and secretary through some of the book. Joyce spent his life after moving to the European continent uh, with Nora, moving primarily between three cities, Trieste, Paris, and Zurich, where he ultimately died in 1941 after undergoing surgery for a perforated ulcer. He was friends with almost all the great and well-known literary minds of his day, including Ernest Hemingway, who famously said that they would go drinking together in Paris. Joyce would have too much to drink and start fights that Hemingway had to finish. One of Joyce's major themes and concerns was to write about ordinary people, assuming the dictum that everyone is the hero of their own story and that the internal lives of common everyday people are no less rich than that of the epic hero. Like the aforementioned Ulysses, Joyce always wrote about Dublin as well. He famously said, for myself, I always write about Dublin because if I can get to the heart of Dublin, I can get to the heart of the cities of the world. In the particular is contained the universal. So tonight we'll be reading two short stories by Joyce from his first published work of fiction, Dubliners. The work is divided into roughly three parts with stories about childhood uh, and with young narrators stories about early adulthood and stories about the end of life, culminating in the last entry, The Dead, which is itself more of a novella than a short story. So I've gone on for quite a bit in this intro. Um, without further ado, we will start with Araby from Dubliners by James Joyce. Araby. North Richmond Street, being blind, was a quiet street, except the hour when the Christian Brothers' school set the boys free. An uninhabited house of two stories stood at the blind end, detached from its neighbors in a square ground. The other houses of the street, conscious of decent lives within them, gazed at one another with brown, imperturbable faces. The former tenant of our house, a priest, had died in the back drawing room. Air, musty from having been long enclosed, hung in all the rooms, and the waste room behind the kitchen was littered with old useless papers. Among these, I found a few paper-covered books, the pages of which were curled and damp. The Abbot by Walter Scott, The Devout Communicant, and The Memoirs of the Doc. I liked the last best because its leaves were yellow. The wild garden behind the house contained a central apple tree and a few straggling bushes under one of which I found the late tenant's rusty bicycle pump. He'd been a very charitable priest. In his will, he'd left all his money to institutions and the furniture of his house to his sister. When the short days of winter came, dusk fell before we had well eaten our dinners. When we met in the street, the houses had grown somber. The space of sky above us was the color of ever-changing violet, and towards it the lamps of the street lifted their feeble lanterns. The cold air stung us, and we played till our bodies glowed. Our shouts echoed in the silent street. 
the career of our play brought us through the dark muddy lanes behind the houses where we ran the gauntlet of the rough tribes from the cottages to the back doors of the dark dripping gardens where odors arose from the ash pits to the dark odorous stables where a coachman smoothed and combed the horse or shook music from the buckled harness when we returned to the street light from the kitchen windows had filled the areas if my uncle was seen turning the corner we hid in the shadows until we'd seen him safely housed or if Mangan's sister came out on the doorstep to call her brother in to his tea, we watched her from our shadow peer up and down the street. We waited to see whether she would remain or go in, and if she remained, we left our shadow and walked up to Mangan's steps resignedly. She was waiting for us, her figure defined by the light from the half-open door. Her brother always teased her before he obeyed, and I stood by the railings looking at her. Her dress swung as she moved her body, and the soft rope of her hair tossed from side to side. Every morning I lay on the floor in the front parlor, watching her door. The blind was pulled down to within an inch of the sash so that I could not be seen. When she came out on the doorstep, my heart leaped. I ran to the hall, seized my books, and followed her. I kept her brown figure always in my eye, and when we came near the point at which our ways diverged, I quickened my pace and passed her. This happened morning after morning. I'd never spoken to her except for a few casual words, and yet her name was like a summons to all my foolish blood. Her image accompanied me even in places the most hostile to romance. On Saturday evenings when my aunt went marketing, I had to go to carry some of the parcels. She walked through the flaring streets, jostled by drunken men and bargaining women, amid the curses of laborers, the shrill litanies of shop boys who stood on guard by the barrels of pink cheeks, the nasal chantings of street singers who sang a come all you about O'Donovan Rossa, or the ballad about the troubles of our native land. These noises converged in a single sensation of life for me, I imagined that I bore my chalice safely through a throng of foes. My apologies. Her name sprang to my lips at moments in strange prayers and praises, which I myself did not understand. My eyes were often full of tears, I could not tell why, and at times a flood from my heart seemed to pour itself out into my bosom. I thought live a little of the furniture. I did not know whether I would ever speak to her or not. If I spoke to her, how I could tell her of my confused adoration. But my body was like a harp, and her words and gestures were like fingers running upon the wires. One evening, I went into the back drawing room in which the priest had died. It was a dark, rainy evening, and there was no sound in the house. Through one of the broken panes, I heard the rain impinging upon the earth, the fine, incessant needles of water playing in the garden beds. Some distant lamp or lighted window gleamed below me. I was thankful that I could see so little. All my senses seemed to desire to veil themselves, and feeling that I was about to slip from them, I pressed the palms of my hands together until they trembled, murmuring, Oh, love, oh, love, many times. At last she spoke to me. When she addressed the first words to me, I was so confused that I did not know what to answer. She asked me if I was going to Araby. I forgot whether I answered yes or no. It would be a splendid bazaar, she said. She would love to go. And why can't you? I asked. While she spoke, she turned a silver bracelet round and round her wrist. She could not go, she said, because there would be a retreat that week in her convent. Her brother and two other boys were fighting with their caps, and I was alone at the railing. She held one of the spikes, bowing her head towards me. The light from the lamp opposite our door caught the white curve of her neck, lit up her hair, and rested there, and falling, lit up the hand upon the railing. It fell over one side of her dress and cut the white border of her petticoat, just visible as she stood at ease. It's well for you, she said. If I go, I said, I will bring you something. What innumerable follies laid waste my waking and sleeping thoughts after that evening. I wished to annihilate the tedious intervening days. I chafed against the work of school. At night in my bedroom and by day in the classroom, her image came between me and the page I strove to read. The syllables of the word Araby were called to me through the silence in which my soul luxuriated and cast an eastern enchantment over me. I asked for leave to go to the bazaar on Saturday night. My aunt was surprised and hoped it was not some Freemason affair. I answered a few questions in class. I watched my master's face pass from amiability to sternness. He hoped I was not beginning to idle. I could not call my wandering thoughts together. I had hardly any patience with the serious work of life, which, 
Now that it stood between me and my desire, it seemed to me child's play. Ugly, monotonous child's play. On Saturday morning, I reminded my uncle that I wished to go to the bazaar in the evening. He was fussing at the hall stand, looking for the hat brush, and answered me curtly, Yes, boy, I know. As he was in the hall, I could not go into the front parlor and light the window. I left the house in bad humor and walked slowly towards the school. The air was pitilessly raw and already my heart misgave me. When I came home to dinner, my uncle had not yet been home. Still, it was early. I sat staring at the clock for some time and when its ticking began to irritate me, I left the room. I mounted the staircase and gained the upper part of the house. The high, cold, empty, gloomy rooms liberated me and I went from room to room singing. From the front window, I saw my companions playing below in the street. Their cries reached me weakened and indistinct and leaning my forehead against the cool glass, I looked over at the dark house where she lived. I may have stood there for an hour, seeing nothing but the brown-clad figure cast by my imagination, touched discreetly by the lamplight with the curved neck, the hand upon the railings, and at the border below the dress. When I came downstairs again, I found Mrs. Mercer sitting at the fire. She was an old garrulous woman, a pawnbroker's widow who collected used stamps for some pious purpose. I had to endure the gossip of the tea table. The meal was prolonged beyond an hour, and still my uncle did not come. Mrs. Mercer stood up to go. She was sorry she couldn't wait any longer, but it was after eight o'clock, and she did not like to be out late, as the night air was bad for her. When she'd gone, I began to walk up and down the room, clenching my fists. My aunt said, I'm afraid you may put off your bazaar for this night our, <clears throat> of, of our Lord. At nine o'clock, I heard my uncle's latch key in the hall door. I heard him talking to himself and heard the hall stand rocking when it had received the weight of his overcoat. I could interpret these signs. When he was midway through his dinner, I asked him to give me the money to go to the bazaar. He had forgotten. The people are in bed and after their first sleep now, he said. I did not smile. My aunt said to him energetically, can't you give him the money and let him go? You've kept him late enough as it is. My uncle said that he was very sorry he'd forgotten. He said he believed in the old saying, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. He asked me where I was going, and when I told him a second time, he asked me did I know the Arab's farewell to his steed. When I left the kitchen, he was about to recite the opening lines of the piece to my aunt. I held a floor in tightly in my hand as I strode down Buckingham Street towards the station. The side of the streets thronged with buyers and glaring with gas recalled to me the purpose of my journey. I took my seat in a third-class carriage of a deserted train. After an intolerable delay, the train moved out of the station slowly. It crept onwards among ruinous houses and over the twinkling river. At West Lundrow Station, a crowd of people pressed to the carriage doors, but the porters moved them back, saying that it was a special train for the bazaar. I remained alone in the bare carriage. In a few minutes, the train drew up beside an improvised wooden platform. I passed out on the road and saw by the lighted dial of a clock that it was ten minutes to ten. In front of me was a large building which displayed the magical name. I could not find any sixpenny entrance, and fearing that the bazaar would be closed, I passed in quickly through a turnstile, handing a shilling to a weary-looking man. I found myself in a big hall girdled at half its height by a gallery. Nearly all the stalls were closed, and the greater part of the hall was in darkness. I recognized a silence like that which pervades a church after a service. I walked into the center of the bazaar timidly. A few people were gathering about the stalls, which were still open. Before a curtain over which the words Café Chantant were written in colored lamps, two men were counting money in a salver. I listened to the fall of the coins. Remembering with difficulty why I had come, I went over to one of the stalls and examined porcelain vases and flowered tea sets. At the door of the stall, a young lady was talking and laughing with two young gentlemen, I remarked their English accents and listened vaguely to their conversations. Oh, I never said such a thing. Oh, but you did. Oh, but I didn't. Didn't she say that? Yes, I heard her. Oh, there's a fib. Observing me, the young lady came over and asked me did I wish to buy anything. The tone of her voice was not encouraging. She seemed to have spoken to me out of a sense of duty. I looked humbly at the great jars that stood like eastern guards at either side of the dark entrance to the stall and murmured, no, thank you. The young lady changed the position of one of the vases and went back to the two young men. They began to talk of the same subject. Once or twice, the young lady glanced at me over her shoulder. 
I lingered before her stall, though I knew my stay was useless, to make my interest in her wares seem more real. When I turned away slowly and walked down the middle of the bazaar, I allowed the two pennies to fall against the sixpence in my pocket. I heard a voice call from one end of the gallery that the light was out. The upper part of the hall was now completely dark. Gazing up into the darkness, I saw myself as a creature driven and derided by vanity, and my eyes burned with anguish and anger. That was Araby. Next we'll read Eveline. She sat at the window, watching the evening invade the avenue. Her head was leaning against the window curtains, and in her nostrils was the odor of dusty cretonne. She was tired. A few people passed. The man out of the last house passed on his way home. She heard his footsteps clacking along the concrete pavement, and afterwards crunching on the cinder path before the new red houses. One time, there used to be a field there, in which they used to play every evening with other people's children. Then a man from Belfast bought the field and built houses in it. Not like the little brown houses, with bright, but bright brick houses with shining roofs. The children of the avenue used to play together in that field. The Devons, the Waters, the Duns, the little Coeg the Cripple, she and her brothers and sisters. Ernest, however, never played. He was too grown up. Her father often used to hunt them in out of the field with his blackthorn stick, but usually little Keo used to keep nicks and call out when he saw her father coming. Still, they seemed to have been rather happy then. Her father was not so bad then, and besides, her mother was alive. It was a long time ago. She and her brothers and sisters were all grown up. Her mother was dead. Tizzy Dunn was dead too, and the waters had gone back to England. Everything changes. Now she was going to go away like the others, to leave her home. Home. She looked around the room, reviewing all its familiar objects which she had dusted once a week for so many years, wondering where on earth all the dust came from. Perhaps she would never see again those familiar objects from which she'd never dreamed of being divided. And yet during all those years, she had never found out the names of the priest whose yellowing photograph hung on the wall above the broken harmonium beside the colored print of the promises made to blessed Margaret Mary Eloquay. He'd been a school friend of her father. He, Whenever he showed the photograph to a visitor, <clears throat> her father used to pass it with a casual word. He's in Melbourne now. She'd consented to go away, to leave her home. Was that wise? She tried to weigh each side of the question. In her home away, she had shelter and food. She had those whom she had known all her life about her. Of course, she had to work hard, both in the house and in business. What would they say of her in the stores when they found out that she had run away with a fellow? Say she was a fool, perhaps, and her place would be filled up by advertisement. Miss Gavin would be glad. She'd always had an edge on her, especially whenever there were people listening. Miss Hill, don't you see these ladies are waiting? Look lively, Miss Hill, please. She would not cry many tears at leaving the stores. But in her new home, in a distant unknown country, it would not be like that. Then she would be married. She, Evelyn. People would treat her with respect then. She would not be treated as her mother had been. Even now, though she was over 19, she sometimes felt herself in danger of her father's violence. She knew it was that that had given her the palpitations. When they were growing up, he'd never gone for her like he used to go for Harry and Ernest because she was a girl, but latterly he'd been going to threaten her and say what he would do to her only for her dead mother's sake. And now she had nobody to protect her. Ernest was dead, and Harry, who was in the church decorating business, was nearly always down somewhere in the country. Besides, the invariable squabble for money on Saturday nights had begun to weary her unspeakably. She always gave her entire wages, seven shillings, and Harry always sent up what he could, but the trouble was to get any money from her father. He said she used to, s to squander the money 
that she had no head, that he wasn't going to give her his hard-earned money to throw about the streets, and much more, for he was usually fairly bad of a Saturday night. In the end, he would give her the money and ask, <clears throat> and ask her, had she any intention of buying Sunday's dinner? Then she had to rush out as quickly as she could and do her marketing, holding her black leather purse tightly in her hand as she elbowed her way through the crowds and returned, her, returning home late under her load of provisions. She had hard work to keep the house together and to see that the two young children who had been left to her charge went to school regularly and got their meals regularly. It was hard work, a hard life. But now that she was about to leave it, she did not find it a wholly undesirable life. She was about to explore another life with Frank. Frank was very kind, manly, open-hearted. She was to go away with him by the night boat to be his wife and to live with him in Buenos Aires where he had a home waiting for her. How well she remembered the first time she had seen him. He was lodging in a house on the main road where she used to visit. It seemed a few weeks ago, he was standing at the gate, his peaked cap pushed back on his head and his hair tumbled forward over a face of bronze. Then they had come to know each other. He used to meet her outside the stores every evening and see her home. He took her to see the Bohemian girl, and she felt elated as she sat in an unaccompanied part of the theater with him. He was awfully fond of music and sang a little. People knew they were courting, and when he sang about the last that loved sailor, she always felt pleasantly confused. He used to call her Poppins out of fun. First of all, it had been an excitement for her to have a fellow and then she'd begun to like him. He had tales of distant countries. He'd started as a deck boy at a pound a month on a ship of the Allen Line going out to Canada. He told her the names of the ships he'd been on and the names of the different services. He'd sailed through the Straits of Magellan and he told her stories of the terrible Patagonians. He had fallen on his feet in Buenos Aires, he said, and had come over to the old country just for a holiday. Of course, her father had found out the affair and had forbidden her to have anything to say to him. I know these sailor chaps, he said. One day he quarreled with Frank, and after that, she had to meet her lover secretly. The evening deepened in the avenue. The white of two letters in her lap grew just indistinct. One was to Harry, the other was to her father. Ernest had been her favorite, but she liked Harry too. Her father was becoming old lately, she noticed. He would miss her. Sometimes he could be very nice. Not long before, when she'd been laid up for a day, he'd read her out a ghost story and made toast for her at the fire. Another day, when her mother was alive, they'd all gone for a picnic to the hill of Howth. She remembered her father putting on her mother's bonnet to make the children laugh. Her time was running out, but she continued to sit by the window, leaning her head against the window curtain, inhaling the odor of dusty cretonne. Down far on the avenue, she could hear a street organ playing. She knew the air. Strange that it would come that very night to remind her of the promise to her mother, her promise to keep the home together as long as she could. She remembered the last night of her mother's illness. She was again in the close dark room at the other side of the hall, and outside she heard a melancholy air of Italy. The organ player had been ordered to go away and given sixpence. She remembered her father strutting back into the sick room saying, Damned Italians, coming over here. As she mused, the pitiful vision of her mother's life laid its spell on the very quick of her being. That life of commonplace sacrifices, closing in final craziness. She trembled as she heard again her mother's voice saying constantly, with foolish insistence, Derevain Saran, Derevain Saran. He stood up in the sudden impulse of terror. Escape, she must escape. Frank would save her. He would give her life, perhaps love too. She wanted to live. Why should she be unhappy? She had a right to happiness. Frank would take her in his arms, fold her in his arms. He would save her. She stood among the swaying crowds in the station at the North Wall. He had held her hand and she knew that he was speaking to her, saying something about the passage over and over again. The station was full of soldiers with brown baggage. Through the wide doors of the shed sheds, she caught a glimpse of the black mass of the boat, lying in beside the quay wall with illumined portholes. She answered nothing. She felt her cheek pale and cold, and out of a maze of distress, she prayed to God to direct her, to show her what was her duty. The boat blew a long, mournful whistle into the mist. If she went, 
tomorrow, she would be on the sea with Frank, steaming towards Buenos Aires. The passage had been booked. Could she still draw back after all he'd done for her? Her distress awoke a nausea in her body, and she kept moving her lips in silent, fervent prayer. A bell clanged upon her heart. She felt him seize her hand. Come! All the seas of the world tumbled about her heart. He was drawing her into them. He would drown her. She gripped with both hands at the iron railing. Come! No, no, no! It was impossible. Her hands clutched the iron in a frenzy. Amid the seas, she sent a cry of anguish. Evelyn! Evie! He rushed beyond the barrier and called to her to follow. He was shouting at, at to go on, but he still called to her. She set her white face to him passive, like a helpless animal. Her eyes gave him no sign of love, or farewell, or recognition. Eveline from Dubliners by James Joyce and if you've made it this far you have got to the end of our stories so uh, I'll give you a, a little bonus um, I'd mentioned earlier um, in our opening I'd mentioned that uh, James Joyce actually started as a poet first and that he was kind of discovered by uh, W.B. Yeats who had encouraged him to take up other modes of writing as well as poetry and with that in mind, uh, I thought I would read you a poem by Yeats, since he's rather famous and also Irish. So I'm going to read you a short poem by him. Aid Wishes for the Cloths of Heaven. It was published in 1899. Had I the heavens embroidered cloths and wrought with gold and silver light, the blue and the dim and the dark cloths of night and light and the half light, I would spread the cloths under your feet, but I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly, because you tread on my dreams. I hope you all have enjoyed our stories this evening, and thank you very much for tuning in. Have a wonderful evening.